Welcome back. Another episode of RX Radio. I told you 2024 would be big. Look back. Who have we had? Stan Efferding, Fuad Abiyad, Milo Sarachev. And now the guy that you wonder, how the fuck does he get away with saying that? Mike Isretel, PhD founder of Renaissance Periodization. Oh, and you know, in his free time, he's also a college professor at Lehman in Brooklyn. Uh, you know, I think I do shit and I think I do a lot of it. And then you got this guy and you're like, oh, I actually don't do anything. Uh, when it comes to like oration and speaking style and just a unrelenting stream of consciousness, I don't know if I've ever had a conversation with someone. I've said four words, me. If those of you who listen know that that's a feat. I just put a quarter in this guy and he just went. So huge shout out to Mike Isretel for making this happen. The busiest guy in fitness without a doubt, but probably puts him all time for busiest on the planet. Uh, super insightful conversation. Mike's current take on, on the fitness industry as his meteoric rise in the YouTube space. If you don't follow Mike on YouTube, uh, do that because it's hilarious. But his channel making progress is also super insightful. A very deep thinker, a lateral thinker. And oh, he's pretty fucking jacked to boot. So a huge shout out to Mike Gazertel for taking the time to have a chat. Huge shout out to Marcos Rodriguez for making this happen. Marcos has been um, almost like an Indian uh, family been trying to arrange our friendship for some time and he succeeded uh, in arranging this podcast so huge shout out Marcos and Mike uh, RP I don't need to tell you this it's all in the show notes and you already know it because he's probably the biggest name in fitness um, and you already follow him and if you don't do it you'll see why after today's episode absurd absurd his we talk about him uh, his attempts at cancellation uncancelable because uh, he's good at what he does and he's super smart and uh, from a business standpoint and from he's really unimpeachable across the board i don't want to alienate the other guests that we've had by saying he's one of the more interesting that i've well he's one of the more interesting people i've ever talked to let's say that so huge shout out for mike thank you so much for coming on um guys if you're interested prescript level one uh, applied biomechanics functional anatomy course taught by me goes live january 29th there is still room in this semester if you want to join head over to www.pre-script.com PSL want to be up on the homepage. Uh, you're going to get the prescript level one manual written by me. It's this textbook here. If you're on YouTube, we're going to go through this in 16 weeks. Uh, if you prescribe exercise for a living, you should know what the fuck you're doing. And that's what we're going to go through. We're looking through load management, structure, function, relationships, length, tension, relationships. We talk about the shoulder, hip, and spine, their arthrokinematics, their joint mechanics, their relative muscular mechanics. It's a lot. It's a lot because it should be because we're dealing with human beings. So if you guys want to upskill your business, your training, this is where I would start. Product first, right? Not sales first, not are you a man over 35, any of that bullshit. Know what the fuck you're doing when it comes to exercise. And this is a really good place to start and upskill. So www.pre-script.com, PSL1, first lecture starts January 29th that'll go into may oh my god it's long yeah it's should be because it's your job and it's people's health so let's get it together here uh ladies and gentlemen without further ado uh mike isretel rx radio lundy hit it you're tuned in to rx radio it's probably been on an annual basis around this time that marcos rodriguez has tried to connect us and I think I'm counting three years now. Um, so it's nice to finally be able to, to, to nab a bit of your time. Uh, so uh, Mike as Rattel, PhD college professor, co-founder of Renaissance Periodation. And something I really want to dig into is the, the new project, uh, Making Progress. Uh, welcome to the show, man. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Marcos uh, is indeed has been trying to connect us for quite some time. And I guess he finally succeeded, sort of. Ish. Yeah, I, I, we're ships passing in the night, you and I, I think. I, I, I think I've seen you in like random airports or at conferences, and it's just like, yeah, that that's the guy on the other end of the, uh, uh, other end of the text message thread. Yeah, and that's such as life, but finally, united. Here we are. Um, I, what do you tell people when they ask you, what do you do for a living? Oh, I don't know, man. That's a really good question. That is the best question. So it, there's kind of like layers to it. 
depending on the looks I get back as to my first response, I often will give later responses subsequently in order to clarify their confusion. So a sports scientist is just what I usually say. And um, most people just don't know what that is. And so what I'll often say is, well, you know, I work uh, with software. I help create a few apps that help people train and diet. And then usually people get it. Um, if they know me as that person in a conversation and it later comes up that I'm also a college professor um, and I also am on YouTube as a content creator, then this has become more confused. Uh, they're like, really? So you do all that? And I go, well, yeah, you know, sort of. So sports scientist is like a good way to start. Um, it's like if you were a sex therapist, you probably just say you're a therapist first. And then the people would ask, like, what kind? Like, you know, people healing from trauma? And you're like, hmm. More like, Maybe. you know, yeah, and a lot of times the best <laughs> sex is, is very healing. I've been told I've never had sex, but I've read a lot of books about it. I think that makes you an There's expert in our pictures. industry. <laughs> Say that again? I said I think that would make you an expert in our industry. You've oh, never absolutely. done it. But you've read a lot of books about it. I have a lot to say about it. That's number one. If you have a lot to say about something, you're kind of an expert. You just make a lot of content. Yeah. Well, I, so I mean, you you were you were born in Russia. Yeah. You spent the early, early days of your life. Uh, bold words from a guy that lives close to Detroit, Michigan. So you know, you know, that really carries. I remember some weight. coming from Russia to Detroit, and it was paradise. By comparison, why wild? Wow, that should carry. That should carry some weight. I love yeah. flying to Detroit because it's the one gate I never need to check the board to know if I'm at. It's Gospel Church, Red Wing jersey, Lions jersey. I'm here. I know where I'm at. I don't need to check I the board. Where all these degenerates are going? Yeah, giant. Hopefully, to never come back. Stainless steel jewelry is really big at Detroit gates. Bad tattoos Spacers and stuff. Spacers, yeah, 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 really yeah. good. Goatees, goatee is the Detroit gate special. An inordinate amount of goatees, you know it. you're in the right place. Um, I love it. I've, I haven't even noticed. I just screened all this out. I, it's like assumed for me. So, it's home. Moving, <laughs> like, did w when did this become the career trajectory? Because like you couldn't, as a child, like go to a high school guidance counselor, for example, and be like, I want to be a content creator, or really, I mean. You couldn't probably even say that you wanted to be an exercise scientist. That was such I like a nebulous, ill-defined right. So how did like when did the like the path you're on start to be set for you and be like, oh okay, like this is this is the trajectory I, I want to take my career? Yeah, good question. So I went to the University of Michigan out of high school and enrolled as an engineer or as an engineering student. And um Engineering was really cool, but um, as I went through college, I got like deeper and deeper into weight training because I was training myself. I was training some friends, and I started to compete in powerlifting. And I got like you know properly obsessed with training. And I thought, well, gee whiz, kind of in a roundabout way, a bunch of different stuff happened. But the TLDR is, I was like, you know, there's this whole kinesiology department for learning about how to do this thing. And since I'm so passionate about this thing, maybe I can learn to do it better and uh, even get a college degree. So I did that, and then I got a master's degree after that because I think I didn't really know nearly as much as I wanted to because it turns out a kinesiology degree is very general. And they don't teach you much about sets and reps and, and how to train. I got through a master's degree, and I still didn't learn a ton about sets and reps and how to train. Then I did one year of uh, industry work in New York City, where I was a personal trainer, along with Mr. Nick Shaw, who's a future co-founder of RP. And I realized I really just didn't know enough, and I wanted to go back to school more. So I enrolled in a PhD program for sports science, and that was um, that was in the first year of that program. It started by Dr. Mike Stone. And I knew who Dr. Stone was from my master's program. I met him once. He was in an institution very close to where I got my master's. And he was a, a supposedly one of the one of the true sort of founders of modern periodization in which I knew scarcely little about and then so when I went to that program a PhD program that is when I learned modern periodization formal sports science and that was really where I learned almost all the stuff that is pertinent to what I do now and that was huge that was transformational for me so it was really like I got into trying to learn stuff about 
exercise science and trying to become better at making myself bigger and stronger and leaner and helping other people do it. And then I just kind of followed the, the crumbles to more and more knowledge until I got to getting my PhD in, in sports science. And during the time that I got was getting my PhD, I had an opportunity to talk to a lot of coaches and a lot of athletes and sort of share some wisdom about, you know, how proper training and diet and organizing the whole process might look. And so I realized uh, along with my being a graduate student instructor that I had a bit of a knack for public speaking. It was really scary at first and I wasn't that good, but then I got a lot of practice as a teacher and as a coach and as a sports scientist talking to a bunch of different people. And apparently my explanation seemed to make some sense to them because they thought like, oh, like, you know, you can you can tell when your effect on a group that you're hanging around with that kind of gets through or doesn't get through. You can even tell in a single talk if people come out with like, wow, that was, I really know a lot more versus like, wow, that was cool. I think I was paying attention or those are a lot of facts, but I don't really know how to make sense of all of that. So I got to be a little bit known, at least in my own head, for being a decent communicator. And then I got a professor job at um, University of Central Missouri doing professor things, uh, a little bit of research, mostly teaching. And uh, at that time, I had already, we had already began the Renaissance Periodization Company, and we had written some books, and we were coaching clients. We had some templates in the mix uh, that were kind of digital products that helped us coach people, help people coach themselves. And then, you know, at some point I had been on a, 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 so I was a content creator with books for a long time. And then I was a lot of podcasts. And then, this is funny, this goes all the way to explaining why I'm on YouTube. Um, I had a YouTube debate on Omar Isuf's channel with Greg Doucette. And Greg Doucette was, uh, as usual, a benignly sociopathic. So I, just, I don't believe Greg Doucette has the normal spectrum of, of human empathy. Um, he'll, do, he'll say anything he needs to to make money, which is the worst thing in the world, but also just that's who he is. Uh, anyone who cares to disagree with that can look at all of the people he excoriates on his channel. That yeah, Greg Doucette, I don't think, is actually allowed, not allowed, he's perfectly allowed to leave his home and go to all kinds of public gyms, but I'm not super inclined to do that because I think about half of all Canadian IFBB pros would probably tear him limb from limb if they ever saw him again. He's, he talks shit about all of them. And so he talked shit to me, so I was like, fuck this, let's do the debate. And I ended up shitting on him so bad in the debate that all his fanboys thought I was very mean. Uh, which was true, but he was very nice on the debate because he flipped the script and was Mr. Mean Guy in his own videos and Mr. Nice Guy to me. And afterwards, uh, we stopped the recording, and he was just really nice. And he was like, Rah, you're pretty good at this like talking thing. Rah, you should be on YouTube. I'm making tons of money. And I was like, oh, that's not a bad idea. So I talked to our video guy at the time who was working for RP, and I was like, do you want to start doing YouTube? And he was like, yeah, yeah, let me like research all best practices and get back to you. So about a month later, he got together a plan, and we started recording YouTube and we started that in like 2020 um, and we're doing it ever since and then a couple of years later we're really blowing up and there's tons of content coming out and so I'm like a professor on YouTube now all thanks to Greg Doucette who I believe his wisest words to me at the time of the after the debate in YouTube strategy was and if I'm quoting it correctly was that you know, was about it mm, but yes, he really did I really do, do owe Greg Doucette that uh, the nod for YouTube so I think in homage of that, we should uh, reference Turk Testosterone or whatever the fuck and the link in bio to which you could get the supplement. So, you know, yes, the, in, the, solid, uh, in solidarity. Yeah, not, not only has Turkesterone been discredited as an effective supplement, Greg Doucette's Turkesterone has been tested in the lab by a few independent parties. Uh, this is on YouTube, I believe, uh, all these uh, videos, and uh, that actually doesn't have Turkesterone in it to the necessary quality or quantity that is expected out of a supplement. So Greg Doucette's still sake, is selling fake Turkesterone, as far as I can tell. Like, I could be wrong about that, but last I checked, uh, that's what he's doing. The internet is My undefeated. Man. Yes, God yeah. bless them. Your muse, really. He is quite your muse. He really is. Yeah. If, if I can impress Greg Doucette at some point with YouTube, I'll know that I'll have done something. I'll be see Greg, A high you, bar. what you said. Uh, I, I want to dial it back because, you know, early days. It's funny, you, you tied in book writing as content creation, which is, uh, I, I think, the, the highest form of content creation. And a lot of the content that I disseminate comes from books I've written. But the, it, you, most people in the TikTok era of fitness, or even maybe in the world at large, don't look at books as content creation, right? Most people, the way they get on, they're probably illiterate. Um, when <laughs> you were at the point, early days, 
of creating content early days RP, like that's not a normal vector for knowledge and wisdom for people who come out of PhD programs. Like knowing a lot of PhDs in exercise science, they kind of go with, you know, like I want to get into a professor role, I want to do research. What was the inflection point for you to start looking at a more scalable business model and being like, you know what, I don't want to just sit in a lab or I don't want to just sit in a lecture hall. I want to start to pursue this outside business venture. Like what was the tipping point? What were like the early day struggles of getting RP off the ground? Sure. So myself and Nick Shaw started RP because fundamentally I had some clients in New York that I helped with diet and that I trained. And Nick had some uh, folks in New York that he uh, trained and helped with diet. And then some of those clients, many of those that when I left New York, they still worked with me for diet, but then, then they worked with Nick for training. And some of them, it wasn't convenient for them to do that, so they worked with other people for training. But they worked with me for diet, so they had some decent results, and they started referring other people to me to work with diet, and that's just online only. And those original people and the new diet people, every now and again, they would say, you know, I told my trainer about the diet I'm on, and he's like, oh, he said it was bad in a variety of ways, and can you attend to these? Can you speak to them? And I was like, well, gee whiz, yes, I'm getting a PhD in this, so absolutely. And so I, I sort of tried to describe why, you know, maybe the pursuit they're on is logical and maybe why the trainer's various questions about it were something less than perfectly sensical. And these are generally very smart, very successful people. Most people that consume diet and training and in, uh, industry input from in New York City, they're, you know, quite well-to-do and they're they're all uh, college educated. Many of them are, you know, geez, like super, super successful business people. So they're pretty logical. And they're like, yeah, that seems to make sense. And then a couple weeks later, they'd be like, I think my trainer's a, a fucking idiot. Is it okay if I swear on here? Uh, oh, please do. Yes, okay. the more the merrier. Yeah. So be like, I think I, I don't think my trainer knows things. Because like the way a lot of people pick trainers, they just show up and take a look at someone who's pretty lean or someone who has a face on the a board of trainers at some 24-hour gym, and they're like, that guy will do just fine. Or, you know, some girlfriend, you know, uh, recommended them. And so they were like, do you know of any good trainers in the city? And it became strange for me to say my friend, uh, Nick Shaw, because it's like, friend is informal. And he's more than a friend. He's a colleague. He's a person that does what I do, except he can help you directly in person. And so in order to help cross-reference, it would be, well, my colleague, Nick Shaw, and then they're like, colleague and what? And then it, Nick and I just decided, you know, let's just go into business together so we can at least seamlessly more seamlessly share clients and if i'm doing their diet and he's doing the training whatever uh, the mix was sometimes nick couldn't take any more clients sometimes i couldn't so we had uh, people came up to us or hit us up a lot of uh, referrals were like hey can you work with me I'm like, no but my colleague nick shaw of renaissance periodization or my colleague in my company and then it made a lot of sense so first we started the company as a way to kind of share clients and then we noticed something that clients were consistently asking us for a rationale as to why we programmed diets and training the way we did, specifically diets uh, a lot of times. And they would say things like, well, these other gurus say that there's something different is the case. What do you think about carb backloading, blah, blah, blah. And we had actually no good layperson nutrition book to refer them to when we were just rehashing the same old. You, you can only write the same email a uh, number of times until you're like, why don't I write this down formally so I could just either send them the book for free or cut and paste right out of the chapter? So then myself and a few colleagues, we had uh, gotten a few coaches to help us work at RP because the client load was increasing. We couldn't do it all ourselves. Myself and a few of our colleagues, we wrote the Renaissance Diet book, the original, and we began to sell it. And this was uh, done actually through our friend Chad Wesley Smith, who sold the book for us on his Juggernaut website. That was really awesome. And... Uh, during the time that I was writing the book, I had, uh, there was a chapter in the book called Designing Your Own Diet or How to Design Your Own Diet. And as I was writing it, How to Design and Modify Your Own Diet, I realized this was an algorithmic process that definitely could be modeled by a computer and done through an app, but also could be done heuristically through kind of like these sequential templates of moving through various diet phases according to how fast you're losing. And I, so I told Nick, I said, hey man, I'm uh, I finished writing the book, but I can make these like Excel templates we can sell so people can do their own diets. And also I think we should make an app, but maybe we can sell the Excel templates first and then work on the app or just uh, just start with the app. What do you think? 
And he said, let's try the templates and see if this concept works, and then we can work on the app if it works out. So the templates started selling, and then uh, through the kind of uh, help with the Renaissance Diet book being out there, the templates became more popular. Then about three or four months later, the first before and after picture started coming out. And then template sales started climbing for a very long time. We used that money to fund the creation of the app, uh, and that was the diet side. And the training side, basically a couple of years after that whole thing started, we were coaching people in training. I started making a lot of content and writing about training, and we realized people also didn't know the modern periodization for training. So we wrote the Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy Training book, and then we had templates that came out with that, then eventually templates for hypertrophy, then eventually the hypertrophy book, and now most recently the hypertrophy app. So it's basically like you try to help people by answering just Q&A as a personal trainer or coach. And then at some point they ask a lot of questions that you're like, yeah, somebody needs to systematize this because it's annoying at the very least annoying to have to answer one off questions all the time without reference to a manual of some sort of like, well, actually, these are all answered. These are all solved problems. And you realize once you create that manual, which is the, the RP uh, diet book, then the strength book and the hypertrophy book, uh, we have other books as well that when you have those kinds of resources, a lot of other people who will never consume your personal um, training or coaching, they all love to read the books. And then a lot of them, after reading the books, they're like, then how do I make my own plan? I, I understand the general theory is really great and answers a bunch of questions, but I want to make my own plan through these books. How do I do it? And we, in the books, describe exactly how to make your own plan, but like just in case you don't want to go through all that fuss, here are some templates that kind of made the plan for you, and you just follow them along. And because templates are kind of a, 2015 era technology uh we upgraded to apps uh recently a couple months ago launching the hypertrophy app and now we have apps that help take care of your diet and help do your training for a much lower uh, you know order of magnitude less money than you would pay a coach and if you kind of know what you're doing and you want some guidance they're really cool so that that's how all that happened it was all based on necessity first necessity was i have to explain to my clients what's going on so i might as well write some books second necessity was i wrote some books but a lot of people need a lot more guidance uh, uh they want just like a bit more of a, a framing for how to do things so here's some templates then after you give people templates a lot of people are like wouldn't it be, this be cool if it was an app and you're like well indeed it would we've been working on it that whole time and so voila there's app and i think my next move as the company is to people want an app but they really want only fans so your boys getting an account together and because you know at some point it's like I, I understand you have ideas and science i just kind of want to see your asshole looks like and you know there's a tear for that shit on my only fans <laughs> you know what i you actually you took the words right out of my mouth as i was thinking wow this guy really has an end-to-end -end integrated model so quite literally end-to-end -end and ver vertically integrated a lot of puns we can make here with the uh, i see i see i see what you did there necessity is the mother of all creation as they say right Oh, yes, absolutely. And that really is the story of the OnlyFans brand and platform. Bless her. Remember that like two and a half weeks where they're like, hey, we're not going to do porn anymore. And everyone was like, what? And we're like, oh, just kidding. Just kidding. We're definitely still doing was, porn. Uh, gotcha. There's a stupid impression I do on the channel sometimes. I call it like 50s kid. It's like innocent 1950s kid. I can imagine him sitting in that boardroom meeting like, oh, gee whiz, fellas. Uh, that looks like a lot of our revenue. They're like, shut up, kid. We'll be fine. <laughs> we don't need porn. A week later, he's like, oh, looks like we're back to adult films, huh? Like, yeah, kid, you were right the whole time, goddammit. Turns out it was 90% of our business or some shit. It was, um, I think they were doing it for some kind of, what I heard was they were doing it for some kind of like, yeah, there's some kind of banking and formal monetary assistance you can't get. Like some some monetary portals just won't work with you if you do X-rated content, and they were like going to see a big ROI from shifting to that. But I guess they quickly realized, like when they did that, I remember being incredulous about it because uh, I don't know anything. I've never actually been on OnlyFans, believe it or not. All jokes aside. Uh, like, I pay for porn in other ways. <laughs> Bet you motherfuckers watching this try to figure that out. Huh? But uh, I don't actually have never been on OnlyFans itself, but I understand some of their metrics are just obscene as to how much money they're getting. And so I was like, when, when, they, when they made the announcement, I thought it was a joke. And I looked it up, and I was like, oh, my God, they're for real. They're going to cancel porn. And I was like, you know, like, when a lot of things happen, your world model incorporates them or it's easily fixed into that. So you're like, eh, that makes sense. Like if you see a guy pulling 800 with the roundest back ever and he's off to the side and he goes, oh, and he, he looks like he hurt his back. You're like, I got to tell you, I got to tell you that was happening. Or maybe if I couldn't predict it, it just at least doesn't surprise me. When OnlyFans decided to cancel porn, I was like, I don't 
know anything because I we also run a digital product company. So I was like, can we do something wrong? Like, this has got a big brain energy going on here that I can't account for. And like, about five days later, they're like, back to porn. I was like, oh my god, thank God, I was actually correct. The world makes sense again. Yeah, they patched the glitch of the matrix for you real quick, dude. Yeah, I wonder. I I just want to be in that boardroom when they decided that, and just see how many people there were like tapping their pens a little faster than usual. You know, like hope this works. I want to. I I think it was more of a. I mean, I'm a, I'm a. I can be a tinfoil hat guy at times. I think Please. it was like, well, you're gonna strum up mainstream media attention about this and it probably brought them more to notoriety in the mainstream than they otherwise were previously and the people were like wait i can see my neighbor's wife on the internet oh cool i'm gonna do that i had no idea this even existed so i think not it was anymore all, not anymore r.i.p but back um, to anymore the guy's like oh my god thank god thank god they didn't go yeah. out of business let me let me see my neighbor's wife i, I already I went through a variety of periscopes <laughs> there's something when it's voluntary that makes it uh no, I don't know. That's not as hot. No, I, I want to see her. It makes it legal. Know. Makes it legal. It's oh, legal. For legal. <laughs> legal. Something about it legal. being voluntary makes it legal. Right. I don't That's know what the, the Michigan laws piece. look like. Oh, so, laws. <laughs> hold on. I got to ask because it's one probably one of the questions that's like the top of my mind in consuming your content throughout the years from books into podcasts into YouTube. The professor jobs that you have. Um, mm. I remember applying for, I was asked to apply for a professor at the University of Toronto and I made it through the application to the point where they were like, uh, race and gender. And there was like a bunch of different things, the more on there. And I was like, oh, okay, I get it. I don't, I'm not going to get the job. White male, University of Toronto, like RIP, not going to happen. And then I'm like, wait, this guy's popping off at the mouth on the regular and he holds it down at a university. Do you just have the most like understanding faculty or how, like how contentious is your digital presence as it overlaps with your professional career in academia? Okay, great question. I've had, I can remember two, two instances which there was some shaky ground. One is I took to swearing a little too often in one of my undergraduate classes when I was a professor in, in real life versus uh, on the internet, because I do online professor now. Um, and uh, my department chair was like, Mike, you can't swear this much. And I was like, understood, and I cleaned it up. And then another institution I was at, there was a girl that was in my class, and I had made a contentious Instagram post, surprise, and she thought, I, be I believe, um, oh, that's right. Here's what it was. I made a joke that uh, implied um, some combination of incest and pedophilia. Uh, and I know that sounds crazy, but the joke was literally like, like oh, like, uh, it was like maybe about a leg workout or something, but it was like, you know, you'll be wobbly and walking around funny like when your uncle came to visit that one time when you were four and it was in the bathroom with you. To me, that's like par for the course, normal fucking joke. If you're an adult, that's like, Yes, well, actually, let me think about it. That never happened. That wasn't a real event. Nobody was hurt. Like, imagine right now a person just getting shot with a gun. Okay, did we just kill someone? No, 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 no. It's all fantasy, right? That doesn't, there's no one actually got hurt. So I thought we were on that wavelength. But uh, one of my students uh, came into the thread and uh, tried to get in there and say that the joke was potentially harmful. And so in my spare time, I'm an avid fan of psychology and an avid fan of a formal and informal logic and debate. So I strung her out for a while, asking her to be very specific about what was harmful and state her claims cogently. She, as would be predicted, uh, lost all semblance of reality during this time and was unable to legitimize her completely illegitimate claims. Listen, if she could show me how it was being hurtful or whatever or harmful, I would absolutely be interested. I mean, Jesus Christ, I don't want to put, you know, could you imagine if I was like, hey, here's the location of innocent people the terrorists want to attack. Like, that's not, that's not funny. That's free speech does not go that far, right? That's like crowded uh, fire, yelling fire in a crowded theater shit. That's illegal and immoral, I might say, even if it's not illegal. 
And I was like, please show me how I'm being harmful. And she couldn't do it. And she tried for a while. And then she reported me to my department as, as promoting these kinds of ideas of, you know, incest and pedophilia and whatnot. And they came in and they were they, they had me sit down and they were like, look, we read through the shit. You're like, we're not going to speak to whether you're right or wrong. We just say as like as a representative of the university, you got to chill out. And I was like, dope. And so I did. And then most recently, I have a job at Lehman College in the Bronx. And um, I, I don't know if anyone there really follows me on social media or checks up on me. And because I never speak really as a representative of Lehman College, although in my critiques of celebrity training, I do. Uh, not None of the stuff in there is particularly contentious, I don't think. But if they ever are like, hey, like, you shouldn't say this, I'll just make a calculated decision of, okay, I'll rein it in, or no, thank you, I quit, and then that'll be that. Uh, it's nice when you run a private company that's lucrative, you don't actually need any other job, and if they give you terms you're not sufficiently cool with, then you're just like, meh. So I'm not too concerned about that kind of stuff, but so far it's just been kind of slaps on the wrist uh, every now and again. And other than that, um, uh, one thing I will say is, I think people make... Um, an assumption that the university's administration is like always watching you. These are regular people. They just don't give a shit. And if someone complains about you, I wouldn't even know where to send an email if I was that. If I was preposterously, preposterously offended by something I said, I'm not sure I would know who to email at various universities in order to get myself in trouble. And I remember like uh, I had this back and forth debate where these leftist Karens got really offended about some kind of body positivity shit I was saying. Again, I was, I was quite uh, quite polite and quite straightforward. They don't appreciate that kind of thing. So they were like, we're going to email you to get you like in trouble with your work. And I was like, good luck. And I don't think anyone heard from anyone. I was like, I don't even know who the fuck you would email. Is it like the department chair? Do they even get that email? Spam box? Like, so at the end of the day, it's uh, actually, you know, and I'm not saying anything actually offensive to normal people. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's my story. I don't know. It's all. It's always bad when it's easier to give feedback at an airport bathroom than it is at a large administration. It's like those little smiley face things as you walk out of a bathroom. Like, who's touching yes. that? Like, yes, it was tremendous no poop here at the Delta Lounge. Thank you. Very good. It was. Yeah, I. I want to. I want an easy way to rate that while I'm pooping, so it can be like kind of a like a live stream rating. <laughs> when, I mean, you've been in academia a long time. You've been in the fitness industry a long time. Have you seen? the evolutions of both parallel each other or contrast in any way? Like, do you, as you, I mean, you kind of walk a, a really fine line. Like you, you know, you put on a, I mean, I'm remiss to say you put on a professor hat and then put on like a content creator hat. Cause I feel like those are very similar, very similar use. I feel like we're only getting kind of one mic across the board, but it, it, as you've gone through both and has ascended the ranks of both like the social media content creation world, and then, you know, the academic side, you know, moving through PH or master's into PhD into professorship. Um, have you seen any similarities in the evolution of both industries or maybe even, uh, you know, at large, the uh, industry of uh, fitness, health, exercise? Um, what has been sort of the what you, if you had to look back retrospectively in the last 10, 15 years, what are some big points or big changes that you can kind of like? put your finger on and be like, you know what, back in the day, that used to be different. Yeah. I don't know how much the academy is evolving. And I say that half facetiously. Uh, I'll say it another way that's more direct and less rhetorical. The academy evolves at a substantially slower rate than private industry. And so a lot of formal academy is becoming marginally less useful compared to going directly into private industry. So there are things you can do in the academy that are really, really awesome and you can't do in private industry, like research, for example, empirical research, formal exercise science studies, etc. There are ways of learning in a really formal manner in internships and things like that with sports teams that you can only really get through the academy. And you, it's difficult to get through private industry. But on just about everything else, private industry is just better because it's way more varied. There's way more content to consume. There are different tiers of content from beginner all the way to advanced that are easily discoverable. 
And the content, the ability to learn through experts in private industry ranges all the way from free, from like you can just watch YouTube and listen to podcasts till you're blue in the face. You'll never get through all of them. And there's a lot of really high quality content out there. If you just decide to binge on like Stronger by Science podcasts or something or YouTube episodes, if you, I don't know, there must be hundreds of them by now, you're going to know a lot of shit. I mean, a lot of in-depth stuff. You don't even learn much of that stuff in school. So there's all the way from free to doing like some some paid stuff, doing certification courses where you can um, accumulate an unbelievable amount of expertise never going to school. I still think there's a place for formal uh, school, but mostly um, as a vetting body to do what in economics is called signaling. There's kind of two reasons people go to school. One reason is to absorb knowledge, or like they teach you things in school. But the second reason is less well-known, and that's signaling. That's to tell other people once you have a degree that you've been through school so that they know there's a higher probability that you know things. So, you know, um, you're Dr. Jordan Shallow. I'm Dr. Mike Isertel. Like that, that means something. And, yeah, of course, quotation marks around both of our degrees. But the I'm University of Phoenix Online is, is a kind institution. Yeah. Oh, well, please. I don't even have a real PhD. Um, but it's so it's nice in that regard. But I think a lot of what you and I know from school, I don't want to speak to you. I mean, you have practical experience, the actual professors helping you do manipulations and things like that, that it's difficult to get in, in private industry, certainly for cheap. But a lot of the stuff you actually convey currently to other people. So with all the podcasting you've done and all the books you've written, if, if someone's like really been a sponge to your content, I'm sure you've talked to some of these people at seminars. You know, when someone comes up and asks you questions, you instantly get on talk. You're like, holy shit, you know, a lot of the shit I said and a bunch of other people have said, you're talking to someone that's like, oh, like they give you really hard questions. You're like, holy fuck, well, hold on. I got to think about some shit I said earlier to answer that one. And you're like, oh my fucking God, like you may be paid 400 total dollars for all of this education that you have. But this is a person without an undergraduate degree, so that's difficult for them to signal that they know things. So it's more difficult for them even on social media to make money and get clients. Like for you and I, it's pretty easy. Doctor, people just come swarming. So other than the signaling part, I think private industry can give you so much of the value and the value prop in private industry is just is escalating rapidly. Like we're doing some work at RP currently. I can't talk about too much. We don't like to talk about work we're doing currently because if it takes longer than anticipated or the project is canned, it's kind of disappointing. Um, but we're kind of designing sort of an online university situation that's going to be like a crap ton of content, which we've already recorded, by the way. Uh, so that's good. But it's going to be an unbelievable amount of content. I don't know, for like 30 bucks a month? Like you got damn, that's hard to beat. Bro, you go to school, that's thousands of fucking dollars. And the quality of education in school is quite high, but now the internet has online courses you can do that are, I don't know, at least as high. So academia, to me, um, other than a signaling mechanism and a place to do formal research, as far as actually teaching people high ROI information about the world, the private industry is just, oh my God light years ahead and and climbing faster so it's good luck catching up but the flip side of the scale is you know the the latency in up-to-date information out of the academy is offset on the on the you know the inverse side of that with the amount of absolute nonsense that can be uploaded at the strike of a key right so it's like there is a middle ground where you know and i guess maybe it'd be interesting to get your take on what do you think the lifespan of that that institutional signaling and its value in our industry is like how much longer before you know the PhD or will it, we you know will it always carry weight like a master's like does a master's get anyone anything now aside from, or are people better off starting a YouTube channel or higher education right now and if not now mm -hmm. when might that be a useful you know parting of ways with like the old analog system we were sold versus the digital solution that's yep. out of us it's a great great question. There are a lot of potential answers to that question, and I'm, I'm, unfortunately I can't see into the future. But I have some, some things to say may be reasonable, some things that will sound wacky, but I believe they're true. So first thing is the industry of helping people with their health and fitness through the Internet is a pie that like grows way faster than you can split it up into chunks. And it's got so many chunks to it, so many little areas of specialty, that you can do a lot of different stuff. For example, Sam Sulik does not have a degree 
is just a guy and he's crushing it on YouTube because he's like relatable and really cool and people seem to want to watch his workouts and banter. There's that all the way to you are someone like, um, what the fuck is that guy's name? Chris something or other. God damn it, it escapes me at the moment. Um, there are people that you won't ever see their face. They just have Instagram accounts or Twitter accounts or whatever, and they publish, like, little infographics that tell Beardsley. you about how Chris Beardsley, my man, thank you so much. Um, nobody knows what Chris Beardsley looks like. You could Google a picture from 2003 or something. But nobody really gives a shit because his following is people who want, like, more data-driven type of stuff and more dry shit, which is, like, awesome if you're, like, an incel autist like myself definitely and many other people you just want to cut straight to it like I don't give a Sam so look you're cool but I don't have time to listen to 30 minutes of your fucking bullshit on your workout I want to know exactly how that works that exercise and I want to know the basic underlying principles of how that works he's not going to teach me that so I'm just in a different consumer market like you know there's people who want to get a bag that will carry their groceries and then there's people who want some kind of Louis Vuitton shit that costs $4,000 another one of those is objectively better than the other it's just different strokes so before you get into the production side on social media and fitness, you have to ask yourself who you want to be, and there's room for almost everybody. Uh, now, almost everyone who does their shit well, but so it's one of those things where if you want to be more of a relatable person, if you want a lot of connectivity with your crowd, and if you want real-world results and you've got a lot of passion and a lot of drive and you want a lot of uh, social media production on your end to be especially organic, you don't need any fucking degrees. Holy shit. As a matter of fact, degrees can make you less relatable because people are, oh, PhD, oh, hoity-toity. I want someone who looks like me, who sounds like me, who's got my educational background. I trust him. I can relate to that person. Relatability is a big fucking thing. On the other end, you want to become a super expert, then you're like, you have all the fucking degrees and shit like that and all the certifications. And then a lot of times what ends up happening is some of your information is consumed directly by people who, who are needing the help with health and fitness. But a lot of it is you communicate to other coaches who might even coach other people who then coach the people that you're actually talking about. Like a lot of the people that tune into the RP YouTube channel, they're coaches and personal trainers themselves. So they get the information from us and then they pass it along to their clients. And some of the people are just regular people. So there's this whole stacked hierarchy pyramid and it, it encircles the whole world of all the stuff you could be doing. So if you want to go down that formal credentialed path, it works. And to that end, to answer one of your questions, no, I don't think a master's degree is a big deal anymore. Um, I think it's fine. I think even an undergraduate degree is cool. But what I would say is there's kind of an exponential by degree level of authority that you gain. And so if you go from no degree to an undergraduate degree, uh it might not be worth it legitimately to get an undergraduate degree in exercise science anymore just if content creation and communicating with clients and making money through the internet is what you want to do. A master's degree has like a small marginal utility over an undergrad and a decent one over not having one, but maybe it's not worth the six years and $60,000 that shit costs. <laughs> That's a lot. A PhD, a doctoral degree of any kind, um, yeah, that carries fuck weight. Because there's a very different thing. And I noticed when I got my PhD, when I was Dr. Mike, so different than just Mike Isertel. Because there's a lot of Mike Isertels, but precisely zero, uh, as far as I know. Maybe in alternate universes, but I'm training to kill them all because there can only be one, goddammit. Um, all other Mike Isertels watching this, motherfuckers, you've been to change your name at least. Run. Um, but, you know, Dr. Mike, geez, that's a big deal. And I've noticed that carries a lot of weight. So for me, only by signaling, if only by signaling, my PhD was a really good idea. Now, I actually went to a PhD program that taught me formal sports science. I owe everything to that program. I became truly Dr. Mike in my knowledge as well from that program. But just on signaling alone, PhD is a big deal. So the landscape of just regular content production without any degrees, if you fucking, like if Sam Sulik was like, hey, should I get an undergrad in exercise science? about like, fuck no, what are you out of your mind? Four fucking years and $40,000 later, Jesus, depends on the school. I went to the University of Michigan, $100,000 later, do you get like a little hat that says bachelors of science? What, what? Nobody gives a shit about that. Nobody even knows the fuck that is. What is your title? Like, still Sam Sulik. Okay, great. What about a master's? What's your title? You can't say master, Sam Sulik. That shit is problematic as fuck. They'll cancel you <laughs> for that. Um, and then what about Dr. Sam Sulik? Oh, so that, that fucks. 
that that idea has a lot of sex with other ideas, making it the alpha male of ideas, and that's something you want to do. So then the doctor is like, it, it, it. there's like a big a big big deal there that does something, and it's it's also similar to how you look or how transformative uh, your physique journey has become. If you're a regular person and you're just baller at making content, you, you'll, that's, that's great. Um, if you uh, have transformed yourself and have been out of shape before and then became ultra fucking ripped, that's a fucking huge deal. You can milk out that transformation for the rest of your journey. Why? Because you're ultra relatable. Other people who just don't look great, they look at you and they're like, I want, I want that. And someone's like, they did that seven years ago. Like, uh-huh, that's nice. So that he must really know how to do it now because he had seven years to think about how he did that shit. He's really an expert. I want what the fuck he's got. But then the next jump is interestingly differently from the topography of the getting the PhD takes you on an exponent of... Uh, of how much that's worth, a lot of people make, I guess, a mistake. Uh, in many cases, it's a mistake going into competitive sports, uh, competitive powerlifting, um, but especially competitive bodybuilding and physique sports. Because if you become a competitor, in order to appeal to people more, you have to win shit. And that's real hard because there's people with really great genetics you're competing against, you just have no say in the matter. If you just compete, if you want to coach competitors, dope. But if you want to coach regular people, if you compete in hypertrophy pursuits, uh, physique pursuits, or even strength world, it just doesn't matter all that much. Now, if you do a strongman meet, you could a couple powerlifting meets, it's actually not that tough. It's a couple months of training and you'll be good. You get a participation trophy. Awesome. That's cool. I think that's great. And even if you want to do a physique show, but if you want to say, look, I want to compete in physique to really appeal to, you got to fill in the blank on that sentence. And it's to competitors and people who want to be competitors. Very small field. And then you have to be good at the shit. Or if you're like me and you suck at competing, you at least have to be objectively super jacked and lean and or have all kinds of other credentials to stack into that field so that when you show up and say, hey, I can coach bodybuilders, people are like, oh, what is it that you know especially? Because if you're just not that great at bodybuilding and you're not that great at coaching bodybuilders, just having done some bodybuilding shows doesn't get you fucking anything. And with regular people, they just don't care. And, and it could even alienate you, alienate you a little bit of ways. You see that with females a lot, where as a female, if you want to be someone that's relatable, don't do a shitload of drawl and get your face looking like a fucking drawl doll if you guys have people knowing listening know what that is. Now, yeah, it's all due respect. First of all, I think drawl doll is a fucking hot look, and I'm all about it. But it's just not as relatable. I mean, I look like a fucking Triceratops or some shit, so nobody's saying I'm relatable. That's not my jam. But if you want a lot of clients in the rain mainstream population, don't you go hopping on the fucking lady sauce. And, you know, you will have a goddess physique. But goddesses are very unrelatable, and this may be not the wisest idea. But if you want to be someone who coaches other competitors or real serious hardcore fitness folks, then, yeah, you should do that. So the way I see it, Jordan, is like... Whatever you go into in the fitness industry, you have to first choose, where do I want to take this? And then choose your plan of attack. I don't think it's true to say, like, for any goal, just get, getting a PhD is a real good idea, or getting a doctor in chiropractic, or getting a medical degree. But you got to have a plan for what the fuck kind of content you want to make and who you want to address with that content. Once you create that plan, then it's like, okay, some PhD makes sense. Or, like, I want to be relatable and talk to regular people. And so here's an example. There's this gentleman named, I'm going to fuck up his name, I think, Mike Duela. I think that's how you say it. I don't know if you know who that is. He has, uh, he started a coaching company a few years back. Mike Duela is a great guy, super personable, super smart, super social. He's just a regular looking guy. He was not so fit, and then he became pretty fit. He was never like ripped or shredded or fucking huge at all. But he's great at the human side and ultra relatable. He eventually got a coaching company, which he had like dozens and dozens of coaches, and I think he sold it for like millions of dollars. He's the fucking man, but he went in there with just super kindness, respect, understanding people are, have difficulties with dieting, being like, look, I'm one of you. And he fucking is. I don't think he has any degrees. I don't think he has any formal education. He's just a fucking good-natured, kind soul who's really good at business, and he fucking did it, and he made a shitload of money, and there's tons of YouTubers. Oh, my God, YouTubers and TikTokers? Dude, there's, some of these people are fucking kids. You're like, Tristan Lee, what degrees does he have? A high school diploma, you know, and like that's what he needs to hit his demographic. Whereas some motherfuckers like you and I, we're all like hoity toity elite educated motherfuckers, but that's just a different demographic that we hit. And so you got to find out what it is that you want to do. And then it may, because I, I do a lot of, uh, sorry to ramble excessively, but I get a lot of people asking me um, in my DMs, like, can you please send me feet pics? Can you please answer one DM so that I know you love me? The typical stuff. But then a lot, another question I get a lot is, 
should I go get an undergraduate degree? I'm really passionate about this. I'm I'm actually a lawyer. I'm starting to coach people and help with diets on the side. I don't know if I want to do law anymore. Should I go to school? And then I ask them, where do you see yourself? Where do you want this to go? Do you want to learn the underlying depths of knowledge to become a creator in your own right and an explainer of deep theory to other people? And they're like, mm, no. Do not go to school. <laughs> there is nothing you, you can even understand a lot of deep theory never going to school. Um, and then if you do want to be those people, then I say, well, yeah, you're in a big fucking long journey of undergrad, master's, and doctoral degree. I just wouldn't stop at any of those. There's some nuances in there, but generally it's like, do you want to go to the pinnacle and get a, a terminal degree? Or do you want to just focus on learning things and um, figuring out how accurately and communicate them well to a wide audience, and then you're a TikToker, and then you don't fucking ever need to go to school. Wow. That's the, Sorry. it's like, no, no, I think we're going to clip that, and it's going to be like the content creator manifesto. But I'm oh, curious shit. if you can My run bad. it back. No, 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 no. It's actually super useful because I, I think it, it sets up good for, like, I, I think it's, I think it's hard truth advice that people need to hear, right? Like, you know, I, I feel like I was the last one out of a burning building going through academia to a, the level that I did, incurring all the debt that I did, and then, you debt. know, g moving into the digital age, right? Like five, 10 years down the line, if I would have done the same thing, I would have been cursing my parents to their early grave. But I was like, all right, we're cool. Like, I'll, I'll take on the L with the debt. I appreciate it. The status thing works to my favor. But, you know, yes. I, I think it's tough for people to, especially people who have gone through it, to, to say that, look, it's not worth it unless you do it to this level. I'm curious if you can do, because that's like a, uh, a, a hitchhiker's guide to content creation and credential. Yeah. Helping people navigate, you know, the likely ROI on, you know, investing in formal education versus going into like, you know, just going into the mass market. I wonder if you can't do the same or something similar from the eye of a consumer. Cause you know, you're, you're probably getting uh, your audience might be split into the people who they themselves are content creators looking to get advice like that about like going to school or creating content or what platform do I go on? Or, you know, do I do a swipe versus a reel versus a story post or whatever? Or do I do, get into shorts? But you also have people who like don't give a fuck about content creation and give a fuck about like the actual type of content you put out. Now you, you know, yeah. you've ascended by by merit to the top with like a ridiculous. I don't know what do you have like eight hundred something thousand subscribers on YouTube or some ridiculous number like that. Yeah, I just past eight hundred k. Nuts. I haven't seen any of that money myself. I still, I'm, I eat like a turkey sandwich for lunch, and I wanted to eat lettuce, but I couldn't afford it. So I, I would talk to your video guy. Send me money soon or something. Okay. All right. He just chains you to the furnace with a camera on and says, talk monkey. At least it's warm. That's nice. Hey, it's cold in the D as a artist once said, if it's a Detroit as reference. A phenomenal artist. Oh man. That's we could how just you go. just, what was her name? Um, I forgot what that bitch name was, but yeah, cold in the D folks just go to YouTube and, and just type in it's so cold and T H A space letter d and turn up your audio make sure other people can hear you listen to this uh and just start bobbing your head because that beat is straight fire when the beat is synchronized but it's not always synchronized because the production is done in someone's basement in detroit but amazing song culture really 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 it's a cultural cornerstone of of detroit michigan I'm wondering if you can't do the same type of diatribe <laughs> to help people on the consumer side vet creators Oh, geez. That's a great question. No, no, you know, I can't. I'm just kidding. Of course I can't. Um, so, yeah. I actually have like a 10-point bullshit detector. I can probably bring up somewhere in my notes. But um, it is a way for people to evaluate to see if they're being lied to. Because that's a big deal. Do you want me to see if I can pick the if I can ram, ramble on that for a second? I, well, I'm uh, curious to see if you can do it off the top of your head and cross reference. Because you brought up something earlier that reminded me of a Mark Twain quote, God. which is like, "If you lie, you never have to. Re if you don't lie, you never have to remember what you said. Or if you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you said." So I'm curious, like, if you just do it off the top of your head now, before picking it up, going like, "All right, what are the ten things I would likely say to figure out if someone's fucking talking shit?" And then go back and cross reference it with the list that you made before. Yeah, 
God damn it. All right. Fuck you. I'll try to <laughs> the, the thing is, is uh, well, all right. Because I actually, I cheated and I already brought it up. Do, do I saw it not light. Look at it? No, no, no. I saw it light up on your face. Yeah. What do you think? Should I? So, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll look at the list in a second. And I'll get these somewhat out of order. Um, when you're consuming content from anybody, but specifically in health and fitness, this works really well. You have to ask yourself a couple of questions because you you have to understand what intellectual space you are in. It is not a space in which you know things. That's why you're in the space because you're trying to find shit out. And because you don't know specifics, you have to use some kind of shortcut strategies to try to reasonably detect. This is all probabilistic, no guarantees, but the source you're getting is actually of information that seems like it's true versus if it's bombastic, insane claims to try to take your money away or if it's just some, some crazy person. And so one thing that you want to look for is, are the claims measured? Like if someone's like, well, you can do this and lose this much weight versus claims that are unbounded. Like you can lose all the weight you want with my program. All the weight I want? Really? Like I started 300 pounds, I can get to 100 pounds like this? That's reasonable. So... That's that's one of the things you should be looking out for. Another one is things that seem to violate the laws of thermodynamics and basic physiology, probably not a good idea. Another thing is, does the person recognize that other people can also be correct? Or are they like, I'm the only one that knows things. Everyone else is lying to you. Everyone else is wrong. Another one is conspiratorial. If someone's like, Big Pharma doesn't want you to know. Like, what the fuck? How? They, they, they police YouTube now, Big Pharma? No, they don't. That's insane. Um... And there's a couple other ones. Can I, can I get through a yeah, couple yeah, of, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. now that I have the list? Yeah. yeah. So um, the checklist is through the BS detector. First, something they say violates the underpinning fundamentals. Like if you violate the laws of chemistry, talking about physiology, and someone catches on to that, bad, bad move. Uh, maybe you don't know things. Um, ignores or dismisses uh, or unconvincingly argues against well-intentioned criticisms. Like, someone's like, well, what do you think about low-carb diets? Like, they're so fucking stupid. They're nonsense. Don't do them. You're like, okay, can you give me any more insight? Like, no, nah, they're just dumb. Like, well, certainly you can explain why they're dumb. Maybe you can say, well, you know, low-carbohydrate diet's a little bit less effective than mixed diets. Uh, here are a few good reasons. If they do that, you're like, mm, okay, okay, some nuance. I like it. They might be onto some truth. Um, if something is layered heavily with emotion and moralistic taboo, like... You know, like Liver King, like you should only be eating organ meats, brother. And you're like, but why? It's like, that's how we were built to be ancestral. And you're like, it seems like you're really excited about something that could just be much more boring and matter of fact. So a lot of uh, emotion and moralistic stuff. Um, if you argue with people who had adherence and they just explode on you and get really pissed, try to argue with some vegans and, and they're just like, they lose it. And you're like, this is not a person I should be listening to. Argue with some other vegans. And they're like, well, the vegan diet has a couple of advantages. And here they are, but it's not perfect because here's the downsides. Um, if you are in a, you start to learn about someone's ideology and there's a lot of assumptions and not a, all of them are by no means clear, but there's a very complex, intricate web of them that you have to accept in order to get their advice. You're like, I don't, I don't know. I think I've been sold a bunch of nonsense or at least I can't vet this in any remotely accurate way. So maybe it's not true. Um, another one is the philosophy attempts to evade uh, testing of its claims. Like if someone's like, Hey, like what kind of research, have you seen done on this? They're like, well, the research establishment is rotten to the core and we just don't do this kind of stuff. Like, just got to believe us. Okay, that seems strange. Um, another one is your content creator fails to define their terms or equivocates on terms or is generally very unclear in language. Uh, uh, language, a lot of times, uh, that is not overly technical, still doesn't make any sense. Uh, or they layer in a bunch of technicalities in order to try to explain something. I think a lot of people who you're going to follow for fitness should be able to explain something in very esoteric technical terms and then when pushed at least explain it in very simple terms if they can't explain what they're saying in relatively simple terms how the fuck are you supposed to consume their knowledge and actually apply it to yourself and or do they really know what they're, they're doing or they're just showing off um, another one is claims that nearly all or almost all or everyone but me is wrong all the other experts are wrong uh, so you'll see that in a bunch of uh, situations like so there's a gentleman in the, the fasting world called, I think, Jason Fung or something like that. 
and he's like, yeah, like everyone who believes calories and calories are out are just wrong. And it's like, but, 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 but these a lot of people are smarter than you, and they work at better schools, and they've published more prestigious journals. Like you think they're all just just fucking just batshit crazy, just wrong, just off on a limb. You're not interested in any nuanced discussion. No, okay, interesting. You might be wrong. Um, here's a big one. Ooh, here's a really big one. They offer you the perfect solution, the ultimate plan. Now, something can be marketed as the ultimate plan, but with an asterisk of being like, look, like it just works. Every time I'm pimping out the RP hypertrophy app or RP diet app on, on the YouTube and everything, I'm like, look, it works. It's a great app. There's other great apps that work. Macrofactor is a fucking great app. Um, there's tons of, you know, True Coach and all these other apps that you can coach through. They're awesome. Uh, our app is awesome too in its own special way give it a shot it, it becomes difficult to say like oh I'm in, insanely biased or something like that but if someone's claiming like their plan is the ultimate perfect plan and it's going to get you exactly the results you want 100% guaranteed that's not really how anything works in the real world you know what I mean like if some of you were buying a piece of engineering machinery for your for your warehouse and someone's like this is the ultimate you'll never need another machine <laughs> what the fuck we update our machinery every 10 years what kind of idiot would say you just be like I right, get out of here like you're clearly lying but if like oh it's got great reliability and every 10 years we have upgrades to offer you're like okay that seems more like it's in the real world um, think about if you were buying a car you don't really know anything about cars either or a computer can you imagine someone coming up to you and like look I'm your rep representative at Best Buy I'm telling you right now if you go to Office Depot or you go to Circuit City they're going to fucking rip you off and they're liars you're going to be like hmm I thought just competitive businesses, but what do I know? And they're like, okay. And you're like, what's the best computer for me? And instead of asking you things about like, do, are you a gamer? Do you do any kind of AI work? Uh, or are you just someone who does word processing? Do you need streaming? They're like, this this model, this is the best. I mean, it's just the best computer there is. And anyone who says otherwise is just trying to get your money. You're kind of going to be like, really? That, that's how computers work? I didn't think anything worked like that. So that's a big problem. Um... Sometimes when they have a high degree of financial or political self-interest, you have to at least question the shit. Uh, a lot of times ideological self-interest. Like if you're taking advice from a vegan on what's a healthy diet and you're like, so why are you a vegan? They're like, because animal killing is wrong. You're like, dope, that's actually a great reason. But what about the health stuff? They're like, well, it's also the healthiest for you. Like, is it possible that there's this gnarly reality where eating some meat is a little healthier for you than eating none of it? but it also comes with this nasty moral trade-off. A lot of times, like, no, 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 the vegan diet's also perfect for your health. Like, I feel like you need to say that for the ideas to make sense in your head because you feel guilty about killing animals, which maybe you should, but a lot of times when someone's like, really drawn to something and they're really beating it to death, that's a big deal. Obviously, financial self-interest, like if you consume V-Shred's content, um, you could be like, well, like, what does he stand to gain? Oh, that's right, he runs a company that sells you the shit. That's interesting. Now, if the way he talks about it is, look, look, here's some great ideas. You don't have to fucking buy my shit. Here's great ideas, and we've packaged them for you. If you want to buy the next thing in our upsell and our funnel, you can, but you don't have to. That's what I say in RP. Uh, that makes me seem maybe like, oh, he's just also giving out advice, and if I want to buy shit, great. I don't feel compelled. You know when you go into a store where people work on commission, they're just like, get right in your face and they're like you're gonna want this you're like i feel like you're not being a real human being if you seem like a content creator is just always trying to upsell you to something um yeah if a little much of that maybe they don't have your best intentions in mind um and also uh lastly low source diversity so if a person that you're consuming content from seems to get their content kind of only from one place and not a bunch of different things. Like for example, if you have someone telling you what to do in training, maybe you want them to have read some studies. Maybe you want them to have coached some other people. Maybe you want them to have tried it themselves. But if it's just one of those things, maybe they're not the best person for the job. Maybe they can get a really biased view. So those roughly 10 things, if you filter people through that, who ends up making it in the end are people who seem like they understand they don't know everything. They know what they know. They're trying to genuinely help you, and they understand that maybe they can't help you. They're just going to do their best, and it's going to work on the margins. So my diet plan that I'm proposing to you, I can explain it. I can attend to why it's not the ultimate diet plan for everyone. I can 
take critiques of my diet plan and talk about, well, here are the downsides of it. Like, for example, the downside of the RP Diet Coach app is that you have to fucking look at an app to tell you what to eat. Fuck that. Like, I don't want this fucking stupid app telling me when to eat. Like, 9 a.m., eat this fucking food. I'm like, fuck, can I get something simpler? Yes, absolutely, there are simpler things. We could, we actually have other products at RP which you can print out, put on your fridge. It'd be just one piece of paper and it tells you what to eat all the fucking time. Way simpler. That has its own downsides. So if someone's unwilling to discuss the downsides and trade-offs of their plan and... If someone is, then, hey, they're, they're at a really good place. And then sort of at the end of the day, they say, like, hey, here's a ton of great information, um, and also I have plans. Somebody, and they don't even need to have all these crazy degrees or anything like that. For example, Jeff Nippert. I don't think Jeff Nippert has a formal degree in exercise science at all. But he passes pretty much all these checklist items. It's, it just seems like a genuine guy that's just trying to help you get fit. Well, and by the way, he has programs you can buy to help, and he's a co-owner of MacroFactor. And you can use MacroFactor to help yourself with his nutrition. But if you watch one of his videos, you don't need any of that stuff. And if, if people say, well, what do you think about these other things? Like, what do you think about high-intensity training? What do you think about training all the way to failure? Jeff Nippert has many videos in which he's addressed those, but it was a very even-handed thing. Like, oh, I think for some people it can work, in this context it can work, but for some people maybe on average it's not a good idea. Then you start to think, gee whiz, you know, if Jeff, if Jeff Nippert's a fucking liar scumbag who just wants my money... My God, he has the most 8D chess way of going about that shit. It seems difficult. And it, it really just seemed probabilistically like he's just an honest person trying to put some good out in the world and help people get more fit. So if you're into that shit, then yeah, that's dope. And then so as you consume content from various content creators who seems to be like they're considerate of other ideas, they're honest, they're open-minded, and they're just trying to good, do good work to help you along. And they're not promising you like psychotic transformation guaranteed because that's a whole bunch of, that's the easiest bullshit detector of like, there's a no-fail system, it's 100% going to work. What the fuck? My mom's tried like eight of those, and she's still overweight. Mom, if you're listening to this, I'm kidding. It was an off-color joke. My mom doesn't listen to this. No, no, neither does mine. She has she has an incentive to Thank at least God. listen to my stuff. Right, yeah, God bless. Majority of people, I would say, do not pass those 10 in entirety. I would say the majority of people might not get past one or two. Yeah. Sure. You are, I, I don't want to say you'd have a target on your back, but like the clout demons that make up the horde of the fitness internet would make it, I mean, it's easy content to tear people down. That's why a lot of people do it. Now. I do it too. I do it to slow well, and that's, and that's kind of what I, that's kind of what I wanted to get into is like, you know, you, you provide a ton of value, but every now and then you, you Vlad the Impaler, some Instagram, TikTok, YouTube person's head on a spear and just let people know like, Hey. Yeah. That could that that could happen. Yeah. You could be coming down the pipe. How do you how do you manage either side of that? How do you manage like the attacks coming in of people like trying to whatever discredit you, falsify your claims, say this, that, and the third? But how do you on the flip side then look around the industry and be like, this motherfucker here is about to get it? Yeah, that's a great question. So, as far as determining how to deal with flack or whatever. One of the things that I think is important to realize is that you don't ever have to respond to anything. And what you choose to respond to is always and everywhere a business and personal brand strategy. So if someone makes a video about you, I remember More Plates, More Dates made an entire video. Okay, so here's how the story went. More Plates, More Dates made a video about The Rock and what steroids The Rock was using. Except the video was subtitled What I Think He's On, and it was purely speculative. Purely. And I went on Instagram and said, this is insane. This isn't just pure speculation. And so Derek, whose last name is, I believe, More Plates, More Dates, yes. got Driver's, upset. Driver's license. And it. he, yes, uh, it's all one word. It's very complex. Um, and he made a video that was entirely about why my head is shaped like it is. And he also, again, purely speculatively, tongue in cheek, uh, speculated that I has been abusing high dose growth hormone. So I could have done a number of things as a response. I could have said more plates, more dates. You're not actually jacked. You have no formal degrees. It's by no means clear. You've accomplished anything remotely impressive with your physique short of taking like a series of maybe two or three after photos that are the only uh, material I've ever seen of yours in which you, you look remotely muscular. And it's literally like just a couple photos of his. 
Uh, and who the fuck are you to talk to me? Fuck you. And if I ever see you in real life, you're going to have a real big fucking problem because how do you know I'm not going to fuck you up? But that all is a combination of really nasty, like weight on your soul and also really shitty PR. <laughs> um, although in a sense it could be good PR because some people love the drama and they're just subscribed for that shit. So I thought, well, you know, I'll just respond to this in another way, which is to say what was true about what he said, say what was not true about what he said and sort of take it lightheartedly. So I was like, here's a picture of me from before I started growth hormone when my head was pretty much exactly the same shape and I hadn't even done any steroids yet. So it turns out it's just genetics. Uh, and, um, but uh, I thought the video was quite entertaining. And that's what I ended up posting on Instagram. I wasn't even on YouTube at the time. And the whole thing just like, well, I don't know, that video's still on there. And so the only remnants I get of that is involuntary celibates who comment on YouTube or um, Instagram and they'll say, LOL, look at his horns. And I'm like, Bob, I see. You're 14 years old. And also, I do have fucking these dope, like, horn-looking things. I think they look fucking sweet. So that's kind of, you know, that that was a way to respond to that criticism. I don't know if it was the best way, but I have another way. I could have just never responded to it. And I think a lot of people, when they want to respond to criticism, they don't do the dot, dot, dot of what happens if you do or if you don't or how you respond. So let's say Derek Moore Plates More Dates may, makes a video to me I consider, about me I consider disparaging. I can respond to it. Or I could just never respond to it. What is someone, what is the downside of never responding to it? I mean, exactly what is it? It's people in your YouTube comments going, are you ever going to respond to Derek Moore Plates More Dates? You can ignore them. Or you can say no. And they go, why not? To be like, well, I think it was like a for fun video. Um, it, it just claimed that I use a lot of growth hormone. He doesn't know that at all. He had a guy in there, actually, Leo and Longevity, uh, who was doing m much of the criticism, and uh, that gentleman has since been, con con believe, alleged or convicted for physically abusing his wife and then summarily died at a young age. So I was like, well, there's not even anyone left to talk shit back to. So a lot of times you could just sideswipe. You never even... So my, the big point here, it's fucked up, right? It's legit true. Yeah, the longevity thing is especially ironic. I mean, yeah, it's like a real person who's dead, so I don't want to talk shit about him too much, but... Jordan, you got to stop laughing, man. This looks bad. I can't, dude. That was too good. <laughs> dude, it's fucked up. It's true. You can Google that shit. I know. So, um, you know, age poorly, you could say. But um, a lot of times, you know, like, let, let's, let, let's ask the question. How did Dr. Oz deal with criticism? Didn't. And he made tens and tens of millions of dollars never addressing criticism. You don't ever have to address criticism. He got called into Congress and was criticized there, and then he just did some PC bullshit and just got out of that too. You know, no big deal. So you never have to address criticism. So actually, my best advice to people, like if you want the drama and you think it's interesting, you should address criticism. But then you should address it in a way that makes you look pretty cool. So you could say, look, okay, let's say Greg Doucette comes after me. And he says, oh, ah, Mike's a liar. Ah. And then I go point by point and go, I think, I think Greg is a, a valid point here. Like, uh, turns out I don't know this super well when he's right. And then the other point, I'm like, I don't think Greg's correct here because reasons. I'm super polite and I sign off. I'm like, right, let me know what you guys think. People watch that. It's tough for them to hate you after that. And the people that hate you after that, they kind of hate you anyway. Fuck them. Like, uh, they're just nuts. Another thing to understand um, is that the people who comment, uh, on your social media are a very tiny fraction of the people who actually follow you and care and buy products from you. And they're split into, I think, two relatively evenly sized groups. One is ultra enthusiastic people that just can't wait to say something nice to you or quest ask a question or something. And the other are just uh, people who are in a really bad spot in their lives and have nothing going for them other than to, to talk shit uh, in a way they would never in a million years do to your face on the internet. Or they're 15 years old or some just trolls. And then them, you just, I, I don't actually recognize their humanity, to be completely honest. Like, if you come at me all wrong in a comment section, I just pretend you don't exist. And the thing is, you don't exist because you mean, look, look, there's all kinds of crazy. Right now, today, thousands of people will die. Just from old age. Do you think about that every minute that you're alive? Oh my God, it would be the, big, the biggest depression ever. There's all kinds of fucking wacky stuff I don't think about. And so I read comments and I go, nah, next. And I don't ever have to respond to it. So the responding criticism side is, uh, to sum up, either respond in a way that you think does justice to your claim and don't get overly defensive. Definitely don't do that. Be like, yeah, I think this person was right in these critiques and maybe I'm wrong, but I think maybe this is how I would, I would say that I thought my shit through. And then if you don't ever want to come to your own defense, you don't have to. You know what the best defense is? Just put out your next piece of content. You know, like uh, we've even, uh, you know, like we could easily try, try, uh, drum up some, some YouTube shit 
uh, Scott, the video guy, and I, who who make our YouTube videos, we could just start talking shit to Greg Greg Doucette. We could be like, hey, Greg Doucette, you're a fucking liar, and we have documented ways in which he's lied. That video would crush. Uh, what does Greg do about him? Greg's not stupid. If he responds, it's money for him, but it's attention for us. And then it incentivizes us to keep making videos that talk shit about him because he makes response videos. And some number of people that watch his response videos will be like, yeah, man, fuck those RP guys. But some number will be like, and Greg's wrong here, bro. These guys are better. I'm going to go follow them. And then all of a sudden, when you are a head honcho, when you're a big deal, like Greg was at 2 million subs or whatever, you got to be very careful who you respond to because you're elevating those people. Do you want to elevate them? I don't know. There's, so there's tons of smaller YouTube creators that have, I don't want to say talk shit, but disagree with my various training philosophies. And a lot of them, like there's a gentleman named, uh, 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 was it Jeffrey Verdi Schofeld or something like that. I think having three names makes you a serial killer for sure. Just kidding, Jeffrey, it's a joke. But he's like some guy who's like white but lives in China. And he's had a couple YouTube videos, which I've seen like thumbnails of, that were like, you know, talking that shit. Like, is Dr. Mike's wrong about MRV? And it's like, that's dope. And and the thing is, I think Je Jeffrey's probably a really great guy. He's just doing a standard old YouTube clickbait, which I never judge anyone for, because that's just how you play the game. So it's like, should I? And people say, you should you should debate Jeffrey Verity Schofeld. I'm like, Dude, when it makes sense on the metrics for us to have him on, dope. For now, you know, he's still climbing up the ranks and still accumulating users. I think he makes great content, but he's not at a level which just like financially makes sense for us to reach out and be like, hey, do you want to collaborate? So I just got to be like, eh, you know, he said some shit. Maybe he's right. Maybe he's wrong. So a lot of times when people get a lot of hate on the internet, a lot of times it's because nothing to do about it. You know, how, does Joe Rogan address critiques about a show? How many, how many uh, commentators has Joe Rogan responded to in, in his YouTube algorithm? Uh, I, I imagine the number is very close to zero because he's busy, busy having sex with genetically engineered strippers or whatever the fuck I would be doing if I had his net worth. I'm tired, worth. tired of regular strippers. I'm sorry. Genetically engineered strippers only. Give me the Monsanto stuff. You you sent Hell out, yeah. you, you put out like a little, like, you know, you kind of organized it hierarchical and like, yo, if you're going to talk shit at the guy at the top of the hill, it serves the guy right for being at the top of the hill. And you take it until the guy's next to you at the top of the hill and be like, all right, you've made it. Congratulations. Let's talk. What is your take sure. on uh, what is your take on like the influencer crowd that shoots down, right? The people who have massive followings that'll take and like you know a lot of times they're not going to give credit or tag people in it. And they create content specifically because I am a firm believer of kind of the essence of what you were saying. That look for the most part uh, an antidote, the antidote to a bad idea is a better idea. But there's a lot of content creators who are at a high level who are who maybe not got to a high level, but now that they're at a high level, they feel like a like a sense of ownership or like they're somewhat the, the, the sheriff of the Instagram, YouTube intellectual department. And they will call a foul of someone on the come up who might be putting out things like, you know, less than verifiable information or, you know, less than valid information or potentially bad or dangerous information. What is your I don't know. Do you do you have a, a, a moral stance or maybe even a moral and a business stance on like, hey, man, yeah. like maybe don't go through the 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 underlings with a pitchfork and, uh, and, a, and a torch burning all of these kids might not be the greatest look. Or do you're like, hey, you know what? The reap what you sow. The, the in, uh, information is easily accessible. Get your shit together. You're going to get fucking scorched by one of these big names. I think it is similar to scorching in the sense that Zeus hitting you with a light bolt, a lightning bolt. Yes, it burns you, but also a god touched you, and you might as well monetize, god damn it. I can't wait till somebody more popular... Like, look, if I went through and said, oh, like, Chris Hemsworth, he trains like shit, fuck Thor, I could beat his ass. If Chris Hemsworth is on record saying anything about me, oh my god, that's a YouTube video that's titled, Chris Hemsworth Speaks Back talk smack about Dr. Mike. You know who's clicking on that? Fucking everyone. That's instant monetizability. That's instant brand recognition. Be pray. If you're a small-scale up-and-comer, pray to God someone who is a bigger deal talk shit about you. Because then you can use that opportunity to, well, gain some traction. Here's an example. Coach Kasim has all kinds of ideas that range from totally legit all the way to fucking wacky. And I suppose we all have a spectrum of ideas like that. He just gets known for his wacky ideas because it's easy to beat up on ideas that are bordering on nonsense. 
And when you do that to Coach Kasim, he comes into your DMs, he comes in to your, uh, your news feed and your comments on the post, and he'll make his own content discussing his perspective of what you said, and he's usually pretty even-keeled, and he usually will think you're wrong, but here are some good reasons. And a lot of people who watch it are like, yeah, fuck this Kasim guy, but they're not following him. But the people who are following him are like, oh, I'm going to hear what Cass has to say. And a lot of times he has to say some pretty reasonable shit that at least uh, caricatures his position as nuanced versus just plain old wrong, and it doesn't even matter if he's right or wrong. He's coming at on top relative to what he was before. So, uh, again, uh, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Shit is so fucking true. What the fuck is somebody going to say to disparage you? And when they're more famous, they got a fucking big problem. As soon as they talk about you, they elevate you to somewhere in fame between where they are and where you used to be. You're now higher. So if someone is talking shit about you and seeing how you're a fucking scumbag. So only one of two things can happen. One, it's true and you deserve to be shat on. And two, it's somewhat true, marginally true, maybe maybe generally untrue, and you use their recognition of you as a tip-off point to respond to their comments in your own public forum, attract a lot of attention. Some people who will read that, your responses will be like, this guy's a fucking tool back, fuck him. Fuck those people. You don't need those people. But a lot of people will read or watch your YouTube video responses and go, oh, this guy's pretty fucking good, man. He's making some good points. And that'll happen whether or not you make good points. Some people just like your macabre. They just like what you look like and how you talk. And then they'll be like, ah, I'm in. And then they sign up. So um, a lot of not all publicity is good publicity, but a huge fraction of publicity is good publicity. So people that punch down, I think they're doing a valuable social function of trying to stop fucking idiots from spreading misinformation. But that's a two, two-edged sword because sometimes you just promulgate those idiots. Like, how many people made videos that uh, Liver King was a fucking idiot? I don't know, half the internet made that video? Did that stop Liver King? What the fuck? It sure as shit didn't. The only thing that stopped Liver King or really put took the wind out of his sails was when he claimed to be drug-free. And then it was just really obvious that he wasn't. And he flubbed out a bunch of stuff. And also his shit was like, you know, he might not be around for a long time because it was clearly a fad. But people punch down, he just absorbed that fucking energy. Remember when people are punching you, you are the center of attention and they're not really punching you. They're just saying things about you. Like if you are a fucking goth kid at school and the popular kids can't stop talking about you to everyone and how big of a piece of shit you are, you walk into school the next day like, am I the center of attention again? Like, yes. Like, okay, well, some of that attention is going to be like, bad where like other people be like you suck and you cry but then like that goth girl in the corner is like you're the guy everyone's talking about you're like yeah bitch you know what i'm saying you want to get a poppin and she's like fuck yeah and goth bitches are the shit you know what i'm saying what up goth girls i'm a married man but back in the old day i would have been too chicken shit to hit on you i don't know where i was going with that well uh, yes but in any case uh it that kind of thing like punching down it i would say it, is, it feels icky sometimes where, like, someone with a million followers is going to talk shit about someone with, like, 10,000 followers. Like, oh, this guy's doing it wrong. But, like, when you're that person, please understand it's a fucking blessing. So just take in all in there. You do just the arguing to convince template. Everything they said that you thought was true, just straight up admit it. Like, someone calls you out for shitty bent row technique. All right? And it's a video where you hit a PR, and most of the reps were good, but towards the end you got a little sloppy. Don't you dare go on the defensive. You go, hey, listen, um... Some of these reps were really good. This rep right here, especially this last one, that's the worst rep ever. That's really what I think. And so I actually thank Mr. Chris Hemsworth for calling me out on my bent row technique. And the rest of this video is about like a, a bent row guide to how you can improve your technique because my technique used to be even worse. Here's a video of me for two years ago. Oh my God, look at how big of an idiot I'm. Let's laugh at me. And now here's a video of me just uh, recording this in the gym with perfect technique. Let me tell you what perfect technique is all about. It's the person who has the worst technique in the internet, according to Chris Hemsworth, or whoever called him out with tens of millions of followers. And now I can tell you how to do better with your bent row. Oh my God, bro. A lot of people are fucking sticking around for that. And all of a sudden you were no, nobody ever fucking talked about you. When people make fun of you, you learn something, and that's it. Anytime someone talks shit about you, you have value of some kind, and it's time for you to extract that value. Put yourself in the best position possible to say, yes, uh, I was wrong about some stuff, or I wasn't even wrong about that. Uh, as long as you don't come off defensive, you come off conciliatory, be like, hey, here's my perspective. Maybe I was wrong. You, f you front that, and it's great. Let me ask you a question. 
If you walk in to a fucking Walmart or some shit with a couple of your friends and you're like a, a relatively speaking adult and one of your friends like uh, like passed the Down Syndrome kid that was like handing out the greeting card thing or like, hello, and it was you fucking retard. You'd be like, dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? Are you out of your mind? None of your friends are cool with that shit. They're like, he's actually retarded. Are you fucking crazy? It'd be like in public, whether people are watching, you're just like, oh, you ever, your friends ever do some shit? And you're like, get me out of here. I just want to teleport the fuck out and then punch my friend in the face for doing some shit like that. People don't ever do that, though. It's incredibly rare. Why? Because everyone knows the person is mentally retarded. And they're like, that's just like some people come out like that, you know, and it fucking blows. All you can do is be kind to them. And if you punch down like that, you're fucking weird. Now, if you make fun of someone that's no, like a uh, normal cognitive ability, they, there must be some kind of value you want to bring them down, right? Making fun of someone is literally in kind of the ling linguistic definition of the term is trying to take them on a dominance hierarchy and settle them one peg down. You know, you know the term bringing someone down a notch or bringing them down a peg? That means they're up on some fucking peg that has a tacit recognition of they got something going for them. For example, why would you ever punch down in a, a video where you make fun of someone's technique? Usually because that person is like, how did you find out about them? Because their video's trending and it pissed you off. And you're like, I don't want this trending video to make people do bent rows wrong. But the trending, that's a fucking good thing. And if you randomly picked someone out to make fun of their technique... They're trending now, motherfucker, thanks to you. You just gave them status. So, like, why would you make fun of that person? Well, like, because he sucks. Like, yeah, but, like, got to you, right? Other people could see this stuff and, and get the technique wrong. Like, uh -huh. So you think other people are looking at them, and it doesn't matter what you say after that because of your video they are. And so when, you're, when you get made fun of on the Internet, it is your opportunity to even handily deal with it and go, hey, namaste. I'm just totally dick for saying all that, but this technique super fucking sucked. But also, like, I think I have some ideas on how to do pretty good technique. So maybe you guys can stick around for that. If not, I understand that you just get followers, followers, followers. People, this is such an uh, extant and well-known mechanism that some people will talk shit. Many people will talk shit up the hierarchy to see if someone talks down to them because, like, Look, if I if I reached over to Jeffrey Verity Schofeld and I was like, let's get you on my channel and fucking debate, or not even, I was like, fuck you, I did everything you said, I'm going to make a fucking video that takes you down. Uh, Derek More Plates More Dates did that recently. He, um, one of the Logan brothers, I forget which one, said something discourteous and Derek got upset. And so he made like a one and a half hour takedown video of their hydration drink where he talks about their hydration drink for an hour and a half. So if I'm Googling their new hydration drink, yeah, the Prime drink or whatever, I've never had it. I don't know. I don't do caffeine. But if I was Googling that shit and I saw someone, Derek Mopin's for dates, 600,000 views in that video, I'd be like... It's a serious drink, and people are talking about it. Now, if I was a big More Plates, More Dates fan, if I had a throughput for an hour and a half hour video, yeah, I'd be like, fuck that, I'm never buying that shit. But I don't matter much, because I'm this much of the world, and the number of people that see the thumbnail is this, and the number of people that click on it is this, I'm already fucking. So if I was Logan Paul or Jake Paul, whichever one that, that he didn't like, and I know that someone responded to me with a fucking super popular video taking down my hydration beverage. I look around like the shelves are still on the shelves and everybody's talking about it. Fuck all y'all. I'm getting rich. So there's, it's really difficult to take down someone like that in any way. So when you make fun of a person up or down the hierarchy, in a sense, if people take it well, everyone can win off of that. That's the fucked up thing. So you just have to contextualize it well when it happens to you. Big advocate for bullying myself. I think that was a tremendous breakdown of the benefits of bullying. And I knew I was going to get that out of you. So, I mean, obviously, a I obviously like a, a deep thinker, uh, you know, you have the initials after your name and the prefix before your name. Making progress. A relatively new channel. Where did you find, I mean, I, 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 I can imagine. Like, where did you find the time? Like, I, I definitely see where you found the motivation for like, I mean, you're talking unemployment, you're talking uh, consciousness, you're talking artificial intelligence. What was, the, what was the impetus or the tipping point to be like, you know what? Yeah, I can't talk about protein and macros and fucking carbohydrates anymore. I need to talk about like the <laughs> other shit. Buy all the products, end-to-end -end integration from template to OnlyFans. Like, just, we got the whole thing there for you. I want to talk about stuff that, yeah. what was, like, walk me through that process of being like, you know what, I want to talk some shit on some other shit. Yeah, great question. So I still, I'm still super passionate talking about protein and all the other boring shit. Um, I think it's great. So that's, YouTube and all of RP is still full send. That's number one in my priority list. But um, what I... 
was doing for a long time, and uh, lately it became more extreme as something that was yelling at me, was um, uh, I, I was, uh, at least when I was younger, uh, very much into politics and especially economics and especially social theory and social psychology and just trying to understand our world and our society as much as possible. And in addition to that, because I am from communist Russia, um, I have the distinct uh, lived experience, even though it's a stupid term, it's just experience. I have the uh, the personal experience of having seen when things are notably worse. And I think like if you grow up in like the suburbs of Toronto or something, the, you may look back on your life and just fundamentally everything was kind of great. Uh, and so you take for granted that the way ideas work in the world and the world that they construct for us just generally lead to like pretty okay things. And so you can get into some ideology that will take those ideas, turn them upside down, make the world shittier just because you think like, oh, by default, it's like if you have really good strength genetics, you don't really know what you're doing in the gym and cannot know for a long time and can try bad plans. They work good plans. They work because it's whatever you have fucking great genetics. Just the same way. If you have the experience of your life being relatively good, you, you may take progress uh, so for granted that you may not even think it's occurring. But when you've had it really bad, like I did in the Soviet Union, and you come to America and everything is just way better all of a sudden, and you have the distinct memory of everything getting better over time, like, oh, things can get a lot better, and they can be worse. And then you start to think, okay, so society is this machine, super complex, and it generates all these outputs. And some of these outputs are things like we really care about, like how clean is the water, how clean is the air, how much civil rights violation do we have? Like if you said, man, yeah, see, like the 1950s was a perfect society, yeah. you know, and you're like, okay, and what about black people? They're like, ah, I get that. We don't talk about those. Like, no, but they literally, they're getting beat to death and bitten by dogs in Alabama. Isn't that fucked up? And they're like, well, yeah. Okay, so this is clearly not the right way. Maybe we can work at the margins to organize. And you see, you go way over on the other end, and you're like, BLM, BLM's fucking great. They're like, I got you. So what happened to the crime rate in almost every major American city after BLM was instantiated? Like, I don't know, it tripled or whatever? Like, isn't that bad? Aren't the same black people getting hurt by criminals? They're like, well, uh, I'm white, so I'm not allowed to comment, and it's just all nonsense. So we all kind of seem to be in a relative consensus about what are good things that we want, and we seem to be a relative consensus of what are bad things that we want, and then we can ask the question of how do we organize society in a way that gives us just more good things than bad things. We've done this in a bunch of other pursuits, nutrition. Like if someone's eating a cheeseburger with some potato chips and a brownie, even if that person doesn't think that's healthy for them, there's just not a lot of people like that's, that's health food, right? Which is where you see like run down inner city with a fuckload of crime and needles in the fucking... Uh, all over the ground, you're not like this, this is the pinnacle of Western civilization. What the fuck? Nobody thinks that. The people in the city don't think that. The council members don't think that. So maybe we can f figure out how to lead to sort of better circumstances and worse. And when I had this sort of remotely figured out, I started to kind of look at who was saying this kind of stuff so I could at least be assured that there was somebody explaining these concepts cogently on the internet. And as some people do a great job, I was like, God damn it, the way I think and reason about this, I think for some small fraction of people, it could be worth it for me to share my ideas because I, the way I think of it is kind of an agglomeration of a couple different philosophies, but none of them completely do justice to the way I think it should be explained. Kind of similar to what I did in the strength world and the hypertrophy world and the diet world. Like I just have a way of explaining things that some weird fucking people seem to think is fine and they like to click on my videos and maybe that helps them. So I thought, you know, maybe I can take a crack at this whole progress bullshit and how to think uh, morally for yourself how to vote, how to organize society, and a couple other things, how to see the world. And uh, to me, this became a really big impetus recently because I'm a big fan of the technological singularity. I don't know if, if you know what that is. M most people have no idea what that is. It's the idea that, do you know what that is, Jordan? Have you ever heard of that concept? Uh, I think so, but I'd be, I'm scared to say yes. Is this like sentient yes, consciousness? Good, like, sure. Yeah, machine consciousness, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, if you look at the history of life in general, life on Earth, and you map every major evolutionary event, and you do that through all of the three technological revolutions we've already had, then everything maps onto this logarithmic exponential curve, and that curve goes basically to vertical in roughly the year 2045. So what does that mean? That means that the world is on track to solve almost every single earthly problem within the next 20 years.
but there can be big delays to that. It's still going to end up there anyway, short of a mass extinction event. There can be delays to that by one or two or three years or five years or even 10 years to where the curve writes itself. The cost of the delay isn't the main goal isn't going to be achieved. The cost of the delay is how many people needlessly have bad lives and or die before that. For example, there is a world in which the singularity is achieved with no world war. There's also a world in which in the next several years, we fight a global war against most of the Middle East, Russia, and China, <laughs> right? Maybe tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that would fucking blow. And so if you look at the world of the 1950s, um, uh, idyllic American 1950s, uh, for whites anyway, right? Um, a lot of people have their own cars. A lot of people have their own homes. There's fast food readily available. Crime is low. Prosperity is like a fucking straight line up. What a great world. Now, was World War II necessary for that? No, fuck no, it wasn't. How many people didn't get to participate in that world? Literally millions. Like millions of Russians just plowed under for no fucking good reason. So I'm trying to put my shit out into the world just so we can steer a little bit more correctly into what I think the future is so that we just don't, we can get there a little faster maybe, or even if we get there at the same place, we can bring more people along with fewer downsides. Uh, so, you know, uh, one of the big things uh, is artificial intelligence. I happen to be of the opinion, and I, I sure very well thought through, that artificial intelligence is the single greatest thing that has happened ever, ever, period. It is it is almost unmitigated good. And, and there are people who are very much advocates for slowing down the process of development of AI, for stopping it altogether, which, by the way, impossible, unless you have a global government, which so far has not worked out, and then maybe also impossible. But I want to communicate on the channel that, look, look, here I'm going to tell you what the downsides of AI are and what the upsides are. And I want you to understand that the upsides are unbelievably transformational. And they're more transformational than the Internet. Now, there were people in the early 90s who saw the Internet coming who, thank God, they weren't mass popular because the Internet didn't exist, but they were against the Internet. They thought it was a big downside. They thought this was going to put people out of work. And they were more wrong than, than, than zero. They were negative wrong, like the opposite of the truth. The Internet has, like, if someone was like, hey, like, is the Internet net good or net bad? If someone's like, I think it's a, it's a net downside, just, you're just talking to an insane person. You didn't, it's someone who's like, I think hospitals are bad. We should just be treating ourselves at home. Like, what are you, fucking nuts? Like, and a lot of people are like, yeah, I don't like the internet, but they're typing that on Instagram, and that's how they're telling it to you. You're like, <laughs> you can't see the irony in this. So AI, to me, is the internet on steroids, like even better in all measurable ways. And so I at least want to communicate something on the Progress Channel that's like, well, let's look at AI, let's look at the downsides, and let's try not to do it like a crazy person would. Um, and then I talk about that so that maybe some slightly marginally more people will talk to their friends at dinner parties and hangouts. And when their friends say, I don't know about all this AI, they might say something like, well, I think, I think it's going to be pretty good. We definitely have to manage the risks, but maybe it's going to have some really serious upsides that we should think about. And then if someone asks like, well, like what, like it's going to put me out of work, like, yeah, it could, but imagine if we have similar uh, intelligence from machines that we get from, from humans. Uh, in the year 2030. Like a machine can do everything a human can do. You say, oh my God, we're all out of work. Totally. But that machine civilization can produce five orders of magnitude more value per year than our human civilization can. I mean, people just aren't that great at doing stuff compared to fucking super intelligent machines. So you say, okay, if we can find a way to chat with the machines and be like, could you guys try to get make us useful at least a little bit or help us become more useful or even just give us a little money so that we still have like an ability to eat food? They could be like, oh yeah, the Petri dish down there that you guys, here's $10 trillion a year for all of you. Like what? But like, it's nominal to them. For example, if someone was to have like a Wyoming nature preserve, just like 100 square miles or something, and be like, hey, humanity, all of humanity, can you take care of the animals in here? It'd be nominally easy. Oh, my God, it's a fucking line item somewhere in the Wyoming budget. It's nonsense. It, the animals basically take care of themselves, just don't pollute their water and shit and make sure to kill off some apex predators that get too out of hand, and, and that's it. You're managing it completely. AI could do that for humanity, no problem. And people here are worried about, oh, it's going to take my job. You might not need to work. Or if you work, it might be a work that you find incredibly pleasurable. And last thing I'll say, a lot of people, especially like this, when you haven't seen long form videos, just they'll, they'll meet this with incredulity. They'll be like, this is completely insane, Pollyanna, super optimistic psycho that thinks machines are going to cure all these ills. That's nuts. Like, the world doesn't work yet. The world is full of trade offs, and it's nasty, and it's real, and it's true, for real. But if you look at history, 
so much progress has already occurred. Like if you think about where you live or where I live, my neighborhood has functionally zero crime. It is functionally 100% clean. And with my money, I'm able to buy all the food that I want from all the corners of the world. And the only thing I bitch about is that like Grubhub takes 15 minutes to deliver food made by other people who I've never met from fucking Thailand, which I've never fucking been to. How the fuck is that possible? And and by the way, I'm not some fucking, I mean, I am a rich guy with a, 10 Lamborghinis and 18 butlers to tend to every Lamborghini. That's right. There's 180 butlers for you motherfuckers paying attention. But uh, butlers are expensive. Um, it, you know, a, a regular person regular average American income or Canadian income can afford absolutely Grubhub because we have this d- data on it. They fucking get Grubhub and, um, and Uber Eats all the fucking time. All the time. It's just normal for regular people to be consuming food that they didn't make from a grocery store. They have no idea how it works for a nominal amount of money that they get paid way more. There's nobody in Canada or America short of drug addicts that have problem buying food. It just doesn't exist. Our obese people are on average more poor than... Okay, imagine that statement alone. Who are the most obese people in your society? They're the poorest people. How the fuck does that make sense? Like, oh, wild, insane progress. Because I don't know, a couple hundred years ago, daily getting your food to mouth was how almost everyone lived except for kings. And now food production is like, oh, yeah, that's a box we just checked. So what are machines going to check for us as far as box? They could check all the rest. Human desires are really quick, petty, and small in the grand scheme of things. It's just not a big deal to take the whole earth and make maybe in 2040 the bottom 10% of humanity could live better than the top 10% do now. How is that possible to surmise? Because if you compare that to 1960, that's the shit. Imagine you're a real real rich guy in 1960. What do you not have? MRI machine, diagnostics techniques, most modern medications... Um, you don't have the internet, so you don't even find shit out unless you go to a library. Now, chat GPT can just tell us the fucking word, right answers about anything we want to ask. And the speed with which GPTs are growing is fucking mind altering to the point where in 2028, the average thing on your phone that tells you what to do, Siri, is going to know, is going to have an IQ of like 200. Any job you do, she's going to be able to help you figure out way better than you to the point where you might be able to auto-task GPTs to just do various parts of your job for you. They don't give a fuck. That's what they're designed for. And all of a sudden, you have passive income. How the fuck is that possible? Is that magic? I think it's reality for most of us. Ta-da! Necessity. The I promise I'm not crazy, man. The I'm not fucking crazy. <laughs> we'll go to his Making Progress YouTube channel and you make your own decision. Uh, Mike, I appreciate you taking the time, man. This was a lot of fun. Uh, Marcos did not did not disappoint. Hopefully, we can run it back in real life. Um, and he disappoints so much, so it's good to see him not disappoint. You know what? He he was due. He was due for a dub, and, and I'm glad you were able to <laughs> take the time and make it happen. I'll, I'm sure I'll see you next weekend at Swiss in passing, uh, as, yes. as we tend to do. And, and fingers crossed, I can grab you for five minutes and, and thank you in person. So, man, I really appreciate yeah, you taking the time. Um, you know, Good luck with everything with RP and, and uh, the channel and the new show and all that, and uh, we'll see you soon.